You are not seeing things. That is a one-of-a-kind V8 powered rear engine, fully automatic transmission, dual track, single seat drag racing snowmobile. It was built by an Articat racer in the late 70s. It's been sitting in a barn for no less than 20 years. So I'm going to see if I can get this thing fired up and then we're just going to pin its ears back and see what this thing's got. Real quick, I want to thank Bespoke Pose for sponsoring today's video. Bespoke is a modern day monthly gift box. So every month you're going to get a different box and they range from bar, outdoors, men's clothing, grooming, the list is long. The nice thing is you can even customize your box, exchange on it hassle free, or you can even skip a month if you want to. I got one here, so let's open it up. Enjoy. Oh, this is going to be cool. Did the package really well. It's a stand for that. The bottle. So what I got here is a white oak barrel bottling kit. It came very well packaged. This is thick glass. I mean, they're not messing around with this thing. And you get your own label here. So basically, you're gonna pour in your base liquor and you could pop in whatever you want here to flavor it up, let her sit. And you're gonna pour your own cold snack, basically. I'm gonna try some bourbon with some bitters and some sweets. Maybe I could pour out something like an old fashioned for myself. And then you can label it. I'm gonna go with like Sasquatch sauce or something like that. Throw it up on the old shelf. This is pretty cool. I put a link in the description for you guys. Vice 20 is gonna get you 20% off your first box. So first thing third, I just gotta throw this out here. This rig is not light. One would assume it is just glancing at it, especially since she's wrapped in cold snack cans, but it took me five hours, literally, to get that off the car trailer and into the shop. I destroyed a trailer fender, I blew out a trailer light, I smoked the chains on my tractor. I drove a two by four through my transmission cooler on my Duramax, which is how I'm supposed to get home. Great. Anyway, with some two by sixes, snatch blocks, come alongs, bungee cords and ingenuity, we finally got her in the shop here. I think we just need to start by walking around this thing a couple times. There's so much going on. It's hard to just get her all you know, in the brain bucket at once. I'm still mind bottled and I've been pacing by it all morning. And this legitimately is a one of a kind homemade machine. We think around 78 or 79. I don't have a ton of information, but I'm gonna share with you what I have. Carmen Johnson was the owner, creator and builder of this. This is him here. He raced for Articat in the 70s. This is a letter from Articat in 77. Here he is here again, and he would have been in his mid-twenties, mid to late twenties. Well, how come I can't, how do you, there we go. Nice looking machine there. And here he is here in the middle with a couple Articat engineers. If you're familiar with the Boss Cat, which was a similar machine basically made just to go extremely fast in a straight line. You can see that's where he got his inspiration from. Unfortunately, he's no longer with us. We don't quite know what his plans were with this. You know, if a guy can't get his hands on one, well, he could just make one or he's got kind of some unique designs to it. I don't know if he was trying to make something to market, but this was obviously his prototype here and it's really neat. I mean, I wish all of you guys could see this in person because I'm sure I'm going to be going over stuff that is really interesting, but I'll try to give you the gist of it. And we might even try to get this body lifted off so we can really see the frame of what's going on here. We'll circle back to the power plant here in a little bit, but Ford small block, automatic transmission, 
And it looks like a lot of the Ford drivetrain came out of something. So we've got all of this, we've got the rad, you've got a shifter down there, maybe a Pinto or something like that. And then this is a dual track. So you've got a track on this side, as well as over on this side. This is probably a better view there. And you can see them on the inside as well. So there's a whole tunnel, snowmobile tunnel. And then there's a whole nother snowmobile tunnel here. And I'll try to lift this up a little bit so you can see. So there is the side of a snowmobile, literally. And he just cut them off here, right about where the engine would have sat. What we can figure is these are 70, 71 Panther tunnels and tracks. This is about a 78 LT gray hood. Can you guys see that? Like this part here. This is gonna be an LT gray. And based on the year that he built this, this hood was literally a year old, brand new or a year old. So he was cutting into some pretty new sleds. And these skis, which would make sense, look like early Panther as well. So one of the tunnels in the back also donated its front skis and probably a lot of the steering components up front. I think before we even dive in, because I wanted to code and figure out what kind of engine this is and hopefully what it came out of. I'm trying to document everything as much as possible on this machine here so we can retain the history of it. But before we get into the powertrain, I want to try to lift this body off a little bit more. I'm extremely curious how he actually built this thing and how it's put together. And maybe we can discover new things. And I really want to show you guys with a better view how he installed the transmission. There's chains. We've got a drive shaft. And then there's a Ford car rear end in here as well underneath the engine that actually comes over to the tracks as well you guys got to see this it's this is the coolest thing i have ever seen i think so let me sit here and scratch my head i'm kind of thinking can a guy bring the lift down extrapolate it bring the lift up and will that pull the body off this isn't heavy by any means and it's not per se attached anywhere actually it kind of just sits on if i had six friends here i think we could you know lift the whole thing off and probably bring it back but i don't so we'll try to use my lift here and try to get this body off so you can see everything in here what's actually funny about this even though it's not a car or a truck it actually does have a smell you see all the mouse nests down there? Of course, it's covered in snow and stuff. So it's got a real pungent, barnish, mouse, oatmealish kind of uh, scent going on to her. Look at the steering wheel. That is slick. Can't turn it. Literally. <clears throat> I don't know how speed, I guess, is how you turn this thing. This is about as low as I can get. These old zoomies get in the way a little bit. By the way, before my trip, through a snowstorm these had stickers on them and that's where we're saying 20 25 years is all the cans were like 92 and 93 is when the cans were put on and that doesn't even mean that's when the engine ran it's just that's the last time that someone even really paid any attention to it for all we know 1979 was the last time that this thing ran so we know that that's got to be a mid 70s most likely late 60s drivetrain in here. But anyway, I'm gonna have to be a little bit careful because this is really actually delicate. Like everything just kinda, you know, we got some floppage is what I'm saying. I'm not even quite sure where to hook onto. So give me a few minutes and I'm gonna try to get a couple different anchor points. And I think like here I got a bar, or actually there's a lip up here where the jack slides in maybe i can come down and snag on some of this i've got to be as careful as possible getting this body off i don't want to wreck anything here i want to keep this exactly how he had it or as much as possible unless we make some improvements 
Obviously, I think we're going to be replacing some parts on this engine. The mice have eaten the lightning hoses up and stuff like that. And we've got snowmobile fuel line. Or did, anyway. Coming from that and whatever else. But I'll get this thing strapped up. I got her rigged up here. I'm not going to brag or anything, but pretty sure I could be a crane operator. Nope, not even close. Since the drip tray has got brakes on her, hung one off of that. That should stay put. This is nice and heavy. That's not going anywhere. So I've got two different points here because I'm thinking it's going to want to fold right about there. Then I got two of the bigger straps in the back. The challenge is going to be as we come up, the body's obviously going to hit this awesome exhaust. So we might only get a foot or two. The machine is not moving. I'm not, there's no, that's, that's not an option. So as it comes up, the body's light enough. I'm hoping it kind of drags, kind of comes back and up. But even if we only get a foot, it might give us a lot more insight on what's going on underneath this thing. So I guess I'll hit the button and see what happens. There we go, we got her lifted up. Now we can see all of the work that went into the frame and structure of this thing. And it is a lot. So cool. Here you can see kind of the skeleton structure of the outside or the body. That's all hand bent. There's a tunnel here and a tunnel over there and I'll kind of show you guys that. But we'll look at the front end first here. We've got, uh, assuming that's throttle, just like a go-kart, you know. Some sort of brake. I'm interested to see how this thing brakes, or if it even does. Lots of tubing. Just a typical steering setup here. Just got a joint over here. Comes off a rack. Goes across. Shifter. Made his own linkage here. That must be off something on the hood up there. Here's a tank. That's just a tank to a panther, it looks like. I'm sure he used all the parts he could off of these sleds. So this would normally sit on the very back of the sled. So that's a fuel tank. And you could see this tunnel here clearly. And this was just torched off. Better view is from the rear to kind of understand what's going on. This was a clutch guard. And this clutch guard sat over like this. But there's the engine and transmission coming back into here. He's got these chains, goes down to a sprocket, and this goes through a drive shaft. And I'll show you closer up there, but there's a axle right there. Here's the brake setup. So he just welded basically a snowmobile disc brake onto the drive shaft. And then he's got this cable that looks like it runs all the way up front. And then he put his own spring in here. So that's how the brakes supposedly work. I mean, in theory they should. Here's that other tunnel. Now if you look closely up there, and I'll bring you in closer, you can see a chain there and a chain there. So those run from the tunnels. The chain goes down to the axle, which is facing this way. And then that's how the drive shaft, so it comes here, goes down, comes back. So you can see that red rear axle right there. And I'll show you from the top view. So there's the chain, drops straight down. And the same on the other side. That's a pretty good view there. You can actually see the gear sprocket down there. 
So really cool how he figured all that out. So then you have full reverse and three speed forward there. So I was looking at the frame rails. This one kind of comes in and comes out. This one kind of goes straight back, but I was looking at this gear. That might be a little concerning because it's actually hitting the bar there, or is really, really close. But I'm assuming he brought this out farther because of the oil filter or something to have to do with the engine. Maybe he was making room for the fuel make it happen or pump and the oil filter or something. Again, we got that radiator, electric fan. There's only one switch in here right there. We'll have to trace the wiring and then there's a key. So I'm assuming that's either ignition or most likely this digital fan because there's really nothing else electric on the whole sled. There's no lights or anything like that. So I'm assuming that once you fire it up, you just flip that fan on and you got all the gauges right there. Just, I just glanced over the engine. I didn't really get into it far, but I could see that the charging whirler wires are unhooked and laying over here. And then we've had mice in here quite a bit. Of course, all the heater stuff is plugged off. We'll get into decoding this in a little bit. I just kind of want to understand how everything on this works. It looks like here's the ballast resistor, starter relay, and the battery cables, but these are really short. So I'm not quite sure if there used to be a tray in here or where he had this battery sitting. I would assume somewhere there, although maybe back here, we might have to look at elongating those or maybe even putting in like a plastic boat tray thing, something like that. Let's just say caution. My biggest fear is if this thing does run, throwing it in the drive and just blowing the plastic drives out of this thing. It's pretty remarkable that they could take the abuse from a V8, but I mean, the boss cats did it and there's gotta be other stuff like this out there, but this is definitely one of a kind that he made here. So now that we kind of can see, and I just wanted to look at this and get this all documented, I think we can lower the body back down and we'll start digging into the engine here. I'm really anxious to see if this thing turns over and see if we can get it to fire up. I really want to hear it. And look at the paint on these. If you're looking at the paint, they're a little burned off here, but I don't think he ran this much at all, to be honest, if you're just looking at the paint, unless he kept repainting it. But I would say just a few hours, if that. And it, nothing's busted. I mean, the chains aren't missing. I don't see heavy wear on anything that he kind of made. It's been clipped and bumped into or scraped down stuff. But supposedly, the rumor is the family remembers him driving up and down the road with this. So it does operate, or it did at one time. It all just depends on if this engine is going to want to fire up again. And is that transmission still going to want to go on the drive? I wonder if a guy should put the battery in now while we got the body up. I can kind of see what the setup is here a little bit better. There's the voltage regulator and the starter relay and all that down there. So I'm thinking it's kind of unclear what he did because these are so short. But I'm thinking I'm just going to set a battery in here and just let her flop around. But I need to extend on these. And these are pretty well shot anyway. So I can get some more length and we'll just plop it in down here. Maybe I'll get a bungee cord. Nope, maybe, probably not. What is this? A bearing, that's a good sign. We'll just put that back there and pretend we didn't see it. Just got finished getting the negative cable in. Why are you always so sad? Anyway, found a couple other goodies that Carmen left us. The charging whirler's unhooked. So does that mean he was getting ready to take this out? It's not charging? Or did he have some other digital problem? Not sure, but if we get it running, as of right now, it'll just be off the battery. So we'll have to see if that charges up. Also, looking under here, found a U-joint. So he's saying, you know, take her easy on the launches there, feller, because them U-joints just snip out. I think the bulk of the smell 
is coming right from that region there. And that's probably the U-joint, that little one there, because it looks to be the exact size, really tiny little guy. So I think if we have a failure, it's gonna be not so much here, but kinda right, you know, here-ish is where that's gonna happen. All right, I'll get this positive hooked on. Just goes on the relay right there, straight down. I didn't know what size to get, so I did the right thing and just got the nine footers. So we'll just lay the extra all in there. So if there's an electrical fire, you know, it catches the seat up too. I think I got some batteries over here. Oh yeah. This one we found out is dead. We've tried it two or three times. I just keep putting it back on the good pile. There's some rubber dust. Uh, Motor Max. Motor? Motorcraft? Uh, that one won't run. Let's go with this Die Hard. Got the battery in, and this is what a guy's brain told him to rig up. And she's, I mean, solid. It's not going anywhere. And when you want to wire things, use the same color cable for everything. It's better that way. I did throw a splash of red on here, though, for the next guy. Even on the zip ties, full custom job. Remember, fellers, in real life, anything that's not DC like this battery here, don't do this to your cables or wiring. It causes issues with impedance, ingress and egress signals, things like that. So when you're running speaker wire, coaxial, Cat5, Cat6, straight lines, nice, gentle bends. Running the fire test here, don't see any smoke, don't smell anything yet. So that's good. Digital wiring might be okay in this. I always like to test for shorts and whatnot before we get too far. I think we can go ahead and lower this body down now because I don't really need access down there. And then we could dig into this engine and figure out what it is. You can place your bets down there in the comments. Uh, 302 seems to be a common one, but I'm not sure. She actually fits pretty snug all the way around. This is the side unit there where the old hood used to stick in. And then I think he cut one of those up and put them kind of around in different places. Can you even imagine how long it took to cut all these pieces? There's got to be, I'm going to say 9,711 pop rivets in this thing. It's a lot of work. He even got a gas flapper. Look at that. She fits on there pretty good. If I get it running, I'm gonna have to figure out how to get this body to stay on. Because I'm guessing anything over 10 miles an hour is gonna have this thing just lifting up on a guy. All right, so I'm gonna get a ratchet down in here and we'll give this thing a crank and see if she turns over. By the by, I'm gonna shoot this out there right now. I'll turn a wrench on any combustion engine in the world. I don't care what it is. But the old brain is just not quite full of Ford facts. So if I miss something or I mess something up or you have some cool information for the family on this build or anybody else, please put it down there in the comments so we can get everything documented on this thing. I'm getting a little excited. Oh, yeah. That works. I'll be dipped. There we go. Took me 16.2 months to get my ratchet in there. The old digital fan's in the way. So I did the right thing and snipped that forward about an inch. Now I got some room. So let's see, this should turn clockwise, but the old lightning whirler turns counterclockwise. That makes sense. Here we go. Oh, she was kind of stuck there for a second. Now it's turning. Now it's getting easier. That's pretty common. Wasn't really stuck, but what happens is the rings kind of build a ridge in all of the cylinders. So the first couple rotations, it's tough until those rings kind of scrape and move all that around. 
But being we know that's the way it was, I definitely need to pull the sparkulators out of here. And let's fill the cylinders up with some juice and kind of just let her sit for a minute while we look at some other stuff. And I just noticed something here I should probably show you. A lot of you probably already noticed this and been jumping up and down. But not only is the old dipstick gone, but it's full of mouse house. Or something. Or maybe someone... Oh, no. Someone stuck a rag down there instead. That's actually more gooder. I was worried we had a mouse house going on there. I am 214% confident I don't have a Ford small block dipstick. So I'll do the right thing and just use some straw or weed whacker string and we'll just guess. But let's move on and try to figure out what this engine is. Now Ford is not like Chevy where you just have a number back here on the block and it tells you everything you need to know. Somewhere on here is a sequence of numbers and letters that should tell us what this thing is. And the same with the heads. If you look that up, it's, well, it could be on the outside. Maybe it's under the valve cover. Or, the best, you have to take the head off, flip it over, and then it's there. We're not going to do any of that. And I already spent about 15, 20 minutes looking all the way around the block, and I didn't see any castings or stampings at all. We are noticing a bunch of different colors here. But there is blue under the white on all of this, and the transmission's also blue. So I'm thinking all of this came out in one unit. I don't know why stuff is mismatched and painted up. Maybe he did a water pump at one time and then painted this stuff while it was off. I don't know. I just, I don't. We do have some numbers in here on the intake. I'm gonna clean that up as best as I can. And that should tell us at least the intake. But again, given everything is the same-ish paint, I think we can get a pretty good idea of what this whole unit is here. So down here, I cleaned this up a little bit. We've got C6OE-9425-A. So we've got 62 different numbers and letters and hyphens and things. How does a guy tell what this is? Well, over the years I've learned on Ford engines, it's just easier to not ask questions and look at the first three numbers and letters. And that gets you pretty close. They started off with a letter and that was decades. So A was 1940, B was 1950, C was 1960, and so on. So that tells us the decade is 1960. The second one is a number, which is six. So just jam the two together. It's a 1966 engine. And then the next one is an O, which is typically a Fairlane or Torino. So this engine, or at least the intake, presumably the whole engine, came out of 1966, 67-ish, depending on when that was manufactured, Fairlane or Torino, which is pretty cool. So it tells us we're in the small block family, 260, 289, 302, somewhere in there. Next thing we could do is take a look at the transmission, and that'll give us another clue. I could tell you just by scanning the peepers on this one, it's absolutely a C4. And I'll show you a super easy way to do that just by looking at the bell housing. Then we'll move on to the firing order because Ford also has 19 of those. And that should narrow us down to what engine this is specifically. I just noticed something else here. And Carmen and I would have been best friends had I known him in the 70s, I'm telling you. I thought this was orange paint. Then I realized, looking at the transmission again, tail shaft is red, body is white, housing is blue. He had the old red, white, and blue scheme going on here. I'll be dipped. Pretty awesome feller. Anyway, moving on to the transmission here. There's a few different ways to tell pretty quickly on Ford what they are. Uh, the placement of the vacuum accumulator, of course the pan shape and size, which is another way that Chevy folks and Mopar folks do it. But I just found just glancing at the bell housing for the most part is the easiest for me on Ford. You can see on this one, it's got a bunch of ribs. There's like three or four on this side, some on the top, and then it's a mirror image on the other side. This is a C4. C3s, it's a, kind of a shorter bubble and they're completely smooth. So C3s are smooth, C4s have ribs all the way around them, 
And then the C6 just have these ribs on the top and they're a little bit more prominent, kind of go down like this. So that's a real fast way, if you have a view of it, what kind of automatic transmission you're looking at there. So next is firing order here. And this turns counterclockwise and Ford, you know, most manufacturers, everything is driver side. So everything counts or starts or is referenced as driver side. Ford is kind of the opposite. So number one cylinder is actually over here. And then it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, back like that. And this is kind of just a quick way to narrow it down some more. We've got one here and then this jumps over to five. So that confirms that this is a 260, 289, 302. If it went one, then three, that could be the HO 302 or 351. So definitely not that. It's 260, 289, 302. And while I was tracing this just a second ago, I happened to find another stamp on here. There it is right there. I don't know if you guys can see that. 289. So I am 98.71% confident this is a 289-1966 with a C4 transmission. So that would make sense that his donor vehicle here, you know, you got the trans, the engine, the rad, all the different hoses, the shifter, everything that he could out of that donor car, assuming it was probably wrecked or something like that. Uh, maybe we can confirm with the family if he had one out there on the farm or something like that. but. If I'm missing anything or you have any information you want to add, again, please put that down in the comments. We want to make sure that I get this documented, you know, as properly as possible. So I'm going to go back and let's go ahead and get these sparkulators out and start soaking this thing down. Wow, what is this? Goodness. Got the porcelain lightning staff set out in the 1976 here look at that pretty cool no physical damage on any of these which is great so we shouldn't have any holes in pistons or snap rings or drop valves or anything like that i'll come back to this one last all of them are burning pretty rich that one's got quite a bit of oil on it actually which is weird and this one was burning a lot cooler you can see there by the porcelain and immediately I saw the crack here, so that's why. She wasn't firing all the lightning. This one has a lot of moisture built up on the electrode tip there, and that could be a couple different things. One, just sitting forever, moisture works its way in through the valves, or two, we're burning coolant, water, antifreeze, whatever you wanna call it, bad head gasket, cracked head, cracked block, hard to say. It would probably be a lot cleaner if that was the case. So I took my camera probe and jammed her down all of the cylinders actually and came back to number one so I could show you. You might not be able to see this, but I thought it was pretty cool. All of that right there is rust buildup and I could see the color here in person, but it's hanging off of the exhaust valve. So that's where all the moisture worked its way in. And give me a second, I'm gonna show you I actually can see where it might have just been this piston uh, was actually stuck. The rings were stuck in the bore. I'll try to find that here quick. Okay, so right there you can see that discoloration and kind of that blotch. That's all rust. So that's where those rings were stuck or froze in this cylinder up here. Also, this cylinder wall looks horribly bad and unfortunately all of them look similar. Very, very deep horizontal grooves and vertical grooves. You want to see a really light, very faint crosshatch. And we don't have that in any of this here. So that's unfortunate. I'm not seeing anything there that says it's not going to run. It's just not going to run probably the greatest. But that's okay. We're still going to send her to the moon. I wanted to do this here and take a close look before I had everything soaked down with juice. So I'll go ahead and do that now. 
and we'll get into the lightning system here. Seeing all the moisture corrosion, I'm sure we're gonna have some sort of issue with the points. This flexible straw is actually really convenient. I'm not sure how much to put in. You just keep going until it feels slightly wrong and then just a little bit more. So I've filled them about five times now and then I slowly roll it over by hand and you can see some of it shooting out. You want to try to get that straw all the way up to the top because remember the, the block is slanted so everything's going to run to the bottom. But I wanted to try to show you this. This one's on TDC. The carbon and black stuff is already starting to flow out. So I'm going to do it a couple more times here. The guy's got the ignition on. So presumably this is all juiced up. I haven't digital metered it yet. I was just curious. And as I rock this around, I'm getting no lightning between the contacts there. So I'm going to have to go through the whole ignition system here, which was kind of to be expected. I'll start with the coil. And again, I'll show you how to check primary and secondary windings. Make sure this is making a storm to begin with. And then we can move on to the contacts. Look at this rotor button. It's brand new. I would have to guess that Carmen's the one that put this in. And again, based on there's not a ton of discoloration on the pipes. We found a broken U-joint. I think he was just in the initial test phase with this. I don't know that he got to, to drive it a lot. And of course, he passed away really untimely and very much too young. Super unfortunate. I would guess that cap and probably the lightning hoses were all brand new at once. The hoses are shot, the mice are into them. I got a GM set, they're 90 degree boots. But being we got zoomies on this now, I think I can make those work. So let's uh, let it soak, and in between testing out the ignition here, I'll keep slowly rolling this over. And it's getting a little bit easier as I go, which is great. So I'll probably stop about there, soak it down. I want to try to catch it when the pistons are up and down. There ain't a lot of you out there still running the points ignition systems. I like them. I mean, I run them in a lot of my rigs, but I'm going to spend a couple minutes on this just in case you have a rig with them or you run across it. Hopefully give you a couple tips here to troubleshoot. We'll start at the key. We're firing 12 volts to our ignition, and then it boils down to the two main components. Ignition coil here, a lightning cam, and then we come up to the points or contacts. Let's start at the coil. These are really easy to troubleshoot and you can just use a multimeter. You've got 12 volts coming in. We'll get back to that in a second. There's two parts to an ignition coil. There's a primary winding and a secondary winding. The primary winding goes around the outside of the coil in a coil. That's probably why they call it a coil. I don't know. And then there's a secondary winding or the core. So this is actually a secondary post or output post. That's the center of the lightning can here. That then connects from here to the lightning whirler. Some of them have the post across. It doesn't really matter. All the contact is doing in here is opening and closing the circuit of the primary winding. So you just have to picture it comes in one, wraps around this, comes out the other, comes into here. So when this opens and closes, that's your circuit in the coil. When this opens, it's disrupting the circuit, disrupting the EMF in the ignition coil, and it ignites the secondary winding. And that's how lightning shoots out of here, transfers through your wire into your cap, right to your rotor button. So when this is flailing around, that's what's shooting lightning down your hoses. And that's how you can advance and retard your timing is based on where the lightning is shooting out, directly at that post on the cap, before or after. So these are really easy to troubleshoot. Basically, we can just ohm them out. I wish I had alligator clips. So basically here, we just jam one post in to the output post and touch the 12 volt in. And you'll see here, 23.4, that's fine. I just got it set to the ohm setting. So that's checking the secondary winding there. 
And the other one, I don't know if I'll be able to do it one-handed, is this touch two posts together, and we want to see one and a half to two, preferably. So one six. Touch on the weaker side, but the primary winding on this old girl is fine. So this ignition coil is fine. So now we can move on, and we're up to our points or contacts. So we can try to run some emery cloth through there, but most likely I'll be taking those out. And it's just, it's easier to replace them. They're like three bucks, uh, super fast as well. But just for giggles, because I'm trying to keep the cost down lower than Chris Gaines album sales, we'll see if we could just clean these up and make that work. So this has been soaked down, I don't know, 19, 13 times. There's a lot of it. Let's see if the starter engages and if she spins over. Well, two things. My new battery's already dying. That's great. Also, she spins over. So that's pretty good, actually. And I didn't hear anything crunching or bending. I didn't hear any valve train snappage. So we're off to a pretty decent start. I did pull the fuel line out of the tank so the fuel pump wasn't pulling any junk up. Another fast way to tell if you're gonna get lightning is just take a old test light. This one's smashed up, but it's got a good ground wire on it still. So we're gonna bond it to our engine, which is grounded. And then all you have to do is just hold the tip over like this, turn the key, and you should see a big spark jumping in there. In this case, it doesn't work. That doesn't mean the ignition coil is bad. Of course, we just tested it, we know it's not. So I know, without even a meter, we're not getting 12 volts to this. Ah, <sighs> great, more wiring. I just accidentally fixed it, but I'm gonna kind of show you what happened. First of all, I dropped my meter in there, and then I struggled getting that out. I always like to start, but just get her off the battery, see what kind of juice we should expect. This has got a ballast resistor on it right here. This is normally up on the firewall. And how you test these is just continuity. And all that means is whatever juice you have coming in should be the same juice coming back out. So if you got 12.2, should be really close to 12.2. If you're in a jam, you could just wire those two together and that'll shoot lightning up here to your coil. All I did was jiggle, 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 jiggle. You can see that's really dirty. I'm sure it's just been peppered with snow and everything else you can imagine. So I just kind of jiggled those around and now I'm getting voltage there. So now I should be able to take my positive lead, come back up here, and if I turn the key on again, and then I rehook up my positive lead again, well, can I get in here? There we go, 12.6. So I'm losing 0.3 something volts, which is actually indicating not a very good bond to ground. So I might take that tail off the battery and just self tap it to the frame. We don't have a lot of digicals on here, but it'll definitely help the starter and the ignition system out. I'm not gonna do it this second because I'm really lazy, but you know, I'll just, I'm gonna put a pin in that. So now I'll run that test again with the old lightning jam sticker upper test 255 XL. Negative lightning, contacts are not doing what they're supposed to be doing. I know I've got 12 volts here. So now I'm gonna hook everything up and I'm gonna test the voltage while cranking. My battery is starting to go dead on me. But when I crank this, this should drop to about a 10, 10 and a half, which is normal. Ballast resistor is doing what it's supposed to do so we don't burn out the contacts here. Let's test it. I think my, yeah, my lead just came loose. I saw a 10 there for a second. So that just reconfirms contacts are bad. Of course, we knew that a long time ago. I just wanted to show you guys a couple different ways that you can go through this ignition system. It's actually fairly simple and I'm not a digital feller. So let's get these out, see what we can do with them. I've been under 1,726 lightning caps and I've never seen this before. This is the springboard to a rotor button. And it was just laying, just hanging out, 
right there inside the distributor. These are completely burned. There's no saving these. So I went ahead and replaced them. Business card. That'll get us set. We can come back with the dwell meter if we want to be picky. I got the ignition turned on. Now watch this. Very obvious we're going to have some lightning storms going on, and I mean a big one. So I guess now that we know she rolls over easy, I'm going to go ahead and throw some sparkulators in it, get the hoses all routed in, them GM flavor. They should work, though. Get the lightning cap on it. And then I have not literally even taken the air cleaner off. So we'll see if the fuel make it happen or is happening. And then maybe we can get this thing to just fire for a couple minutes. That would be pretty good. And then we can move on to like, how do you even, what's the, how do you, what's the process on changing the oil on this thing? What do you, how do you do that? A guy's probably put 11.37 billion of these sparkulators in on the channel. And a guy got to thinking as I was putting the last one in on this machine, I don't think I've ever just sat down with you and talked about the importance of these things. In my opinion, these are one of the most overlooked components to an engine, and they're actually one of the most critical components. And for what I'm seeing on the interwebs, reading plugs is a dying art. It's just, it ain't happening anymore. Younger generation, even my generation and older folks, they're just throwing AFR gauges in it, making a couple adjustments on the carburetor and saying, yep, my engine's running the best it can, and it's not, and here's why. If you really want to make optimal changes for performance, fuel economy, and engine longevity, you have to understand how to read a plug, not only what's happening in the combustion chamber, how it actually works. You also need to understand the heat range. And if you can do that, you can actually make adjustments at each cylinder, and now you're gonna get some performance out of the thing. I've even seen some folks out there completely overlook sparkulators when they have issues like dieseling, or they're gonna to try to mimic dieseling, and they just play with timing and fuel. Well, did you know that if you have too high of a heat range, and this guy right here, you can cause pre-ignition, pinging, and dieseling. Just by changing your heat range, you can bring yourself out of that. There's actually a lot into these little guys, so today we're just gonna do super high level on the old heat range real quick, and then I just wanna get, I wanna get back and fire this thing up. Heat range is just how quickly this here guy can dissipate combustion heat and it's referred to as cold and hot, and it's just a range. Every sparkulator is measured differently on that chart, but it usually is the last number of the part number. So this is a BF42, and for an auto light, lower the number, the colder the plug. This is a really cold plug. Too cold of a plug, you can get it fouled up like this with soot, gas, oil, deposits. It's the sparkulator's job to self-clean. What you wanna do is get your sparkulator into what's called the self-cleaning zone, which is right in the middle of the heat range, but again, it varies by each engine, your combustion, your fuel, your octane, all of that. So you really have to pay attention. Too hot of a plug, then you're gonna get into pre-ignition, dieseling, pinging, so on and so forth. Since all of these auto lights are fouling up over here, we don't want to panic and just assume the engine's bad. We need to make some adjustments first, read the plugs, then we can come back, analyze it again. And of course, there's things like leak down tests, compression tests, and so on that can also help you tell the health of the engine. But don't panic if you got sooted up plugs. Doesn't mean your rings are shot or anything like that. Being all these auto lights are fouled, I picked up an NGK, and not because I'm just a huge fan of NGK, but it has the heat range that I want. This is a 2438 plug, and for an NGK, that puts this right in the middle of its heat range, but it's significantly warmer than the Autolite. So we're gonna run these for a bit, and if we get it running, which I'm pretty sure it will, after we run it for a bit, we'll pull these out, take a look at them. And we're trying to see a toasty brownish gold on here, and then we're good to go. Got the battery trickle charging. We're gonna need some CCAs out of that bad boy. Went to check on the oil. There is oil in it. I use this tube because I think what I'm gonna end up doing is just suckalizing it out here instead of farting around trying to drain it. Kind of lucky I used the tube because when I push this through, it did catch a bunch of gunk. I'm assuming right where it transfers from the tube into the where does it go? Block pan. I don't know. It hooks into the engine. 
All the lightning hoses, everything are in over here. Had to make a get in liner up or over there with the zip tie, of course. So we're making progress. We'll just move on to the fuel now. See if this is still making anything happen. Probably not. I don't know why. Everything I work on has got a 78 foot wing nut bolt. I just never seen. Wow, that's actually surprisingly clean looking. Nothing's locked up. I'm assuming that air cleaner has never come off, which is great. And it's got a metal mesh on it so the Mises didn't get down in there. Whatever that means. Cool. Well, I can't wait anymore. Let's just dump some fuel down this thing and see if we can at least hear it pop off a few times. If it fires, then we'll move on and get this oil changed out. I don't want to run it too long with what's in there. It looks pretty snot very gooderish. And unfortunately, I can't taste it, so I can't really tell you the truth on what's going on in there. Got the old Lone Wolf 6000 hooked up. That's handy. And then this is fuel that I mixed up probably a month ago, two months ago, getting the snow machine running. And it's actually really great for engines as well. It's got some two-stroke oil on it. And that way if it don't fire, and even if it does, you're throwing some oil on the upper end of the cylinders there, lubricate on her while she's trying to get going. All right. We got some smoke out of one. The smoke is just this oil. <laughs> this is going to be loud. guys see all the stuff shooting out of the pipes? That was all that buildup on those valves. And I don't know what else. We'll go look. It started crawling on me. It says it's in park. I guess I should have looked a little bit closer. She might be in reverse. Uh-oh. Man, this thing was really throwing out the... Go on, look at all this rust. Huge chunks. See, and that was sitting flat on the valves on the underside. We saw that with the camera. Got a ladybug. Wow, all of that. Look at this. This side was significantly worse than that side. I didn't really see much coming out of there, but man, this side was really throwing the stuff. Well, I'm gonna see if I can get my own fuel system set up here. And what I'm gonna do, I think, is put a filter in line here. I'm not gonna go through the hassle of trying to get that tank out. I'm assuming. Since the cap is on, there's not much stuff in it. It's definitely been stored empty. So I'll put a filter in there. We'll drop this tube back down. What I'll probably do is unhook the ignition, crack it up here, spin it over for a few times, see if the fuel make it happen or pump her upper is even pumping up the fuel to the fuel make it happen or upper. And if that's good, then we'll hook everything back up, see if we could fill the bowl up on this and get this thing idling. I should probably also look a little bit closer Pretty sure that's in park. Guess maybe I'll open the door in case he just goes on shooting. Got the fuel filter in over here. It's looking snazzy. But I did change on my mind. I think before I keep cranking on this, even to check if the fuel pump works, I'm gonna change on the oil first. I just, I'm getting nervous since I couldn't taste it. I don't know, I don't know what's going on in there. I'm gonna use my little pump and try to pump it out of the oil checker upper dipstick tube hole. Might work, probably not. 
She's tied in the battery here that's still charging, dumps into that, snipped into there. Hey, no milkshake in here, so I think we're good. Look at this old school filter, FL300. Long life oil filter. I always run Wix as a rule of thumb, but I don't have a lot of Ford parts in stock, just usually Chevy and Mopar stuff. So I had to run down in a pinch and grab that one from CarQuest. Got the good one though. Really tight fit in there actually. I had to just gently slide it in, try not to mess up the O-ring gasket, but she fit. Tig rod oil checker 440. She's engaged. I think we got it empty. We do have slight milkshake-ish looking stuff. And kind of concerning because I, I really doubt this was winterized in any way. This is empty. So I mean we're just gonna have to just send it and see if we've got bad head gasket, cracked head, cracked block, hard to say. None of the freeze plugs are popped out of the side, thankfully. So hopefully she was she was drained. If we're lucky, because I'm not going to look, we'll dump some juice in there and she might just start pouring out. Maybe they cracked the pet cock down there, but hard to say. Let's throw some Earl back in here and see if we can get it running off the tank. Today's flavor is my trusted standby build shell with Tela T4. Heavy duty diesel oil. This is actually going to make this mid 60s engine, the camshaft, valve train, the bearings, real happy. Oh, but that's way too much. I'll just keep going. Alright, let's see if we can get this thing fired up again. Hopefully on its own fuel supply. And I'm sure the needle has got to be stuck or sticky, but we'll find out. Ignition is hot. I'm going to watch the filter here, see if it pumps. It's pumping. Is my question on was she winterized? I'll take no for 700, Alex. 
Water pump basically split right down one of the veins. You can actually hear it dumping 71 gallons on the floor. That'll be fun to work in. Called the local parts store, no dice. Gonna have to shoot over to the Minnesota side, see if they got something. And of course, Ford water pumps rotate 15 different ways and there's 97 bolts and they always leak when you replace them. And at least she's fairly easy to get to though. So I think that's gonna pretty much do it for this video. We got her running. Miraculously, this thing fired right up, sat there and idled, still got some issues. She ain't banging on all eight, I'll tell you that. Uh, number two cylinder, pretty lazy, but we still have a lot of work that can be done in the carburetor. We could look at the timing, of course the old Italian tune-up. She just needs to get the cobwebs blown out of it. And then we gotta fix the water pump, of course. So next time you see this thing, We'll get all of that dialed in, then we're on to the transmission. We'll see if we can scoot this thing around a little bit. That would be cool. Thanks for watching guys, we'll see you next time.